Okay, good afternoon, good day. Uh, welcome to NYU, New York University Stern School of Business. My name is Matt Statler. I'm the Director of Business Ethics and Social Impact Programming here in the Undergraduate College. We're thrilled uh, to welcome you all, uh, students, alumni, external guests, uh, to today's event, Digital Finance for the Sustainable Development Goals. We do a lot around the Sustainable Development Goals here at NYU Stern. It's a big operation. We've got four required undergraduate courses in the Social Impact Core. We've got a major in sustainable business, a course, major course of study in sustainable business, a concentration we call it. A whole bunch of uh, professors doing research, research centers on business and human rights, uh, sustainable business, uh, Center for Sustainable Business. And we're thrilled to welcome many of you here in town for UN Week, for Climate Week. Some of you I may have seen in the haze and the dust at the climate strike uh, on Friday. We were down there with a group of students enjoying the atmosphere. Um, but here today we're, we've got a, a, a great uh, group of guests. It's been a, a thrilling collaboration with the UN Capital Development Fund to organize this, uh, this event. My first job, though, is to introduce the student clubs, the students who have helped uh, organize this event and who will be helping make sure that what we do here today is not just a one-off, one-time thing, but that there will be uh, steps going forward, ways for you students in the room to continue the conversation and to connect with the organizations that are here represented. So first up, uh, Maggie from Economic Development Club, Did I get that? ACG, it's a new club, pardon my stutter. Maggie and, and Jordan. Hi everyone, really excited to see uh, everyone here today. My name is Maggie, I'm a senior here at CERN and this is my co-president Jordan Wolkin. Um, we run the new club Economic Development Group, which is a club that focuses primarily on the role that businesses specifically play within the development space. And so in pursuit of that goal, we aim to engage with different organizations like the ones that we have presenting today um, to see how they're solving uh, challenging social problems um, and really working within that space to empower customers, entrepreneurs, and communities. So really excited to be a part of the conversation today and see how FinTech is specifically playing a role in improving communities standards of living. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie, Jordan. And uh, next up will be uh, Alex and Lauren from Net Impact, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex, as Professor Sally just introduced me. Um, I'm one of the co-presidents of Net Impact along with Lauren, and I just want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank our speakers for coming in. So Net Impact inspires and equips emerging leaders to help build a more just and sustainable world. And I feel like that's what we're trying to do here with our student engagement. So I want to thank all the students for showing up and for the UN to really try and engage the student body. And hopefully this leads to a more fruitful and long-term collaboration. So I want to thank you all for coming in today. Thanks. Give it up for the students, please. Uh, and, and then, uh, again, I'll uh, be very brief, but just to say, uh, Ahmed Dermish, who will be next up to present on the uh, UNCDF's uh, sort of work streams, the, the way in which they're trying to address the challenges associated with financial inclusion and digital economies. He will be joined, and I'll let you introduce the panelists who will take the stage after you. But please, join me in welcoming Ahmed Dermish. Can I use the mic? I gotta use this. I'll use this. Afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks for the intro, Matt. That's great. And it's, thanks for the student groups for inviting us. Uh, it's a great opportunity to share how we see UNCDF solving some of these large, seemingly intractable, but you put enough minds behind it, it seems a lot more possible. Um, these massive problems that we have organized by the SDGs. So. Um, what I will do over the next five or 10 minutes is share with you our latest thinking. Uh, we call it a strategy, but a strategy always evolves. And so this is our la last and latest evolution in how we see the United Nations Capital Development Fund uh, addressing the issue of uh, development across the many impacts that we want to see in the Sustainable Development Goals, health, education, uh, water sanitation. And we see the digital opportunity, digital transformation, digital tools as one of the key enablers, and in many cases, a catalyst for that change. 
So bear with me, a little PowerPoint. Um, and then I'll be followed by a much more interesting panel um, of fantastic field practitioners, people um, from Google, from GoGet, from research from Caribou Digital, who will share with you from their experience how they've actually been solving the problem, uh, facilitated by my colleague Sabine Mensa uh, from UNCDF. What we'll hope to get you doing while we're talking and sharing is actually thinking about how you would solve some of the problems that we're trying to tackle together. We're not pretending that UNCDF is the place to go to for the solutions, but we're the place to go to to help think about, organize, deliver, and learn about how we can solve these problems. Uh, we're not necessarily here to do it alone. Uh, we need all of you to do it. And so do think about how you'll bring your solutions to the table, and we'll give you specific instructions in that regard in a moment. So from our side, leaving no one behind in the digital era, who does that, what does that mean? We could use Janet. Uh, Janet uh, has a small little shop in Uganda in the Bidi Bidi refugee camp up north. What is our role in terms of helping Janet be a more productive member of the economy, but also to serve her needs, uh, to raise her family, to run her shop, to have more security, more safety, more choice? The way we look at it is she probably needs increased skills, um, more economic opportunities, increased access to quality and affordable basic services. This is all sort of the jargon uh, that we would normally use, but what does that really translate to in reality uh, in the financial services context, for example, how financial inclusion and digital financial inclusion could deliver that? We would start with the basics. How would Janet store and save money? So she doesn't have to save it under her uh, mattress anymore. She doesn't have to save it in a box. She doesn't have to use a savings group. She might have a little bit more autonomy. And then when she does have that ma money, how does she send or receive payments so she can have more formal and perhaps more flexibility in her financial transactions with others? And this is how we would think about creating an environment in which we can develop and design services that could benefit Janet um, and people like Janet. So. We think about her use case. She wants better education for her kids. Can we help her learn from her peers? Can we find ways to use financial services to give her better access to health? For example, paying doctors digitally so she doesn't have to carry cash on the bus when she goes to the hospital. Um, in terms of receiving payments, how does she go to the marketplace, buy supplies? Is it more efficient? Uh, can we use the mechanisms of payments and the mechanisms of stored value to help her learn about financial planning? We'll get some really great examples from um, GoGet on how you actually build that learning into the transactional relationship that you design with these uh, with digital opportunities. Um, and then how do we give her advice to grow her business? So the, the nature of services that we see our focus on digital economies and the digital financial services component isn't always focused necessarily on the financial service per se, but the ecosystem of attributes around that service. You could apply exactly the same thing to Joshua, um, also uh, in Uganda, but in this case, a dairy farmer. So a very specific uh, use case. Again, how do we increase skills, improve their opportunities, increase access to quality services? We're seeing some familiar stuff here, storing value or storing money, receiving payments, perhaps in his case, improving their digital and financial literacy. But with Joshua, we're looking at a very specific outcome. So how do we give him information about perhaps the market rates for milk when he's trading, um, the nature of uh, his peers in a very narrow context of, 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 of dairy farming, uh, access to a market to buy inputs, learning how to develop his resources, cows, farms, etc. And so again, you start to see this ecosystem of services around the context of agriculture, around the ag context of a trader. And from our view, it's not just about the financial services per se, and it's not just necessarily about the channel per se. He may have a phone, but that doesn't really do him much good if we can't do more with it. So that's the context. Those are the people, in a sense, a face to this situation that we're trying to address. So how do we organize our thinking around that problem set? helping Janet and helping Joshua find ways to be more economically empowered, to be more productive, and to have better choice. Fundamentally, our vision is to promote digital economies that leave no one behind. 
you know, we, we strongly believe in having a big ambitious goal, um, but we do think that you need to break that down into its component parts. Uh, we're looking to equip millions of people by 2024, specifically uh, to use innovative digital services in their daily lives. And that's really important to us, that people use, that they see value in this, that they will use it daily or near daily. Because that will give us the scale, that'll drive costs down, that'll imply ubiquitous value. And then ultimately, the assumption is that if they see value in it and they use it, then they'll be contributing to things that matter to them. And as we know, the sustainable development goals are oriented around things that are, matter to people. Health, education, sanitation, etc. And so how do we organize our, our thinking? This, in a sense, at the bottom here is the DNA of our approach. So on one side, we have our SDG 17 and partnerships for the goals. So we partner with public and private stakeholders because we're not the ones necessarily delivering the service. We might catalyze it. We might invest perhaps through grant capital or equity in small startups, firms, banks, mobile operators to test new ideas. We might help regulators build data systems so they can collect market data, so they can design policy. There's many ways in which we would help stimulate these ideas, but we always seek partners by which to do that. And then we use that relationship with the partners to unlock very specific market constraints. It could be around money. It could be around uh, use cases like health, agriculture, better information, uh, et cetera. So these are actual product, actually specific products and services that you can touch, feel, and price. And think about how do we start with these ideas and our organizing view on this is how, what is scalable. It's great to be able to get a solution to affect 1,000 people. It's better if it can affect 100. It's transformational if it, can, if it can affect a million. So the idea of using partners to deliver value across those use cases at scale, we believe that if we can find those solutions, then we will deliver impact at the, across the SDGs. And ultimately, we feel as a consolidated approach that if we deliver impact across those SDGs, ultimately we will reduce poverty. So 17 to one is how I like to phrase it. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot in between. This is very much the DNA of our approach. <clears throat> but the how matters. Uh, this is, you know, General Assembly week. Everybody's talking about their visions, but you know, I think it's perfectly reasonable for all of you to say, okay, great, but how? You know, how do you actually see yourself doing it? And so we break it down into, into this sort of relatively simplified, simple does not necessarily mean easy, um, this, this simple framework. <clears throat> we take a market development approach to how we solve problems. So we would organize the market into these four work streams. We've got empowered customers, which is relatively self-explanatory, inclusive innovation, where we see innovative products, innovative tools, innovative approaches being applied to the issue of inclusivity. How do we reduce the digital divide? Um, we'll talk about what that means in reality. Is it a divide? Is it a chasm? Is it a, is it a spectrum? Is it a continuum? Um, but we think about how innovations can actually address the issue of exclusivity, in inclusivity. And so those are sort of critical cross-cutting themes our open digital payment ecosystem is what we would call one of our rails. So we need to have open uh, infrastructure that everybody can access affordably to give them access to markets, to allow them to cross geographic space um, without having to get on a bus to make payments, for example. Um, to make that infrastructure available, accessible, and reliable is fundamental because then you can trust it. If you can trust it, then that new service you get over your phone is more reliable to you because you know the payment's going to go through and you're not going to lose your money. So really focusing on that infrastructure component. And then the last work stream is on our policy and regulatory side, which is to say the government has a critical role in creating an enabling environment where they create rules, they create conditions. In one case, they might advocate for particular pricing, which is delicate, or taxation of services to stimulate their own investment. On the other side, they may stay out of it and let the markets take a role. And then in the middle, you've got governments that try and broker relationships. We see this in the case of Malaysia, for example. And so we really encourage policymakers to not just think about writing rules, but to really engage with the market in an enabling fashion. So that work stream, in a sense, are the bones of our approach. Our instruments are our muscles. This is what actually gets it to work, right? So when we think about this market development context, how do we intervene? Well, when we think about research and we think about application, consumer customer centricity is fundamental. We always need to think about what the customer value is to this. 
So we always put the customer in the center of our design. Data and research is relatively self-explanatory. What, what problem are we trying to solve? Is there a precedent? Are learnings from other countries, can they apply wherever we are? And if not, why not? Answering the why not can often get us leaps and bounds forward because we understand why a particular market is unique. Stakeholder engagement, this is often about bringing public and private sector together. So we create this common vision at the market level. And then expert technical advice and training is where we bring our technical expertise and expertise of you guys here in the room, where we find others um, globally who can help solve very local problems, often with global context or deep local understanding. And then de-risking financial instruments is our way of saying, well, if a bank won't invest in a building a network, maybe we'll help them out. Maybe we will, in, we will provide some capital to build out a component of that network to prove the use case. You know, one of the famous stories in UNCDF, for example, is in Uganda, a mobile operator was less than excited about putting up a tower in an area where we had farmers uh, because the, they said the tower wouldn't be profitable. And no tower, there's no connectivity, no connectivity, there's no mobile money. And we said, well, okay, we'll cover the loss on that tower. We didn't have to cover it because the tower proved relatively profitable relatively quickly. But that willingness to go in and cover that is sort of the how. It's those are the muscles that we apply to our market development context. And in the impact that we want to see is really self-explanatory. We see women, youth, MSMEs, sort of micro and small medium enterprises, migrants, refugees as our key constituents. These are the beneficiaries of the work that we want to do. And we, want, and we see those solutions happening at scale. But you know, how do we do that? Well, we think digital services can really empower people to lead these productive and healthy lives if we put the customers in the middle, if we use data and research, if we get stakeholders at the table, if we give them good advice, if we think about how our financial instruments can add value, and across all these four areas. Each market will look at this, and each market will have a different mix of these solutions. And so I'll stop there. Uh, one thing I would like you to think about in the context of the panel, and I'll introduce Sabine in a moment to bring the panel up, uh, is from these four work streams, um, I'd like you to listen out in the panel to hear about from their experience, where are they solving problems across these issues? And then the other half of that question is for you, each of you has a talent, each of you has a skill, each of you has an ambition and a goal, so how would you bring your value to solving for that problem. And then we'll have conversations amongst yourselves at the tables where you can share with each other and then hopefully share with us and say, well, for innovation, we think for agriculture, particularly dairy, maybe you could do it this way. Maybe there's an app for that, right? So um, think about that, write it down, listen carefully. Um, and we're really excited, I'm actually quite excited to hear about what you guys might come up with because um, more brains are better than mine, for sure. Um, so uh, without any further ado, I'd like to kindly invite Sabine Mensa uh, from our Dakar office to, oh, you don't need this actually, uh, to invite up the panel. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully this this is going to work for the panel, right? Because it's going to be odd to sit here and have the panelists over there and me trying to figure out, you know, how I want to start the conversation. So my name is Sabine Mensa. I'm a regional specialist uh, in digital finance. I am based in Dakar, Senegal in West Africa, and I cover our portfolio in digital innovation in West and Central Africa. So it's an honor for me to be here today. For those of you who don't know me, which will be most of you, I am very shy, so I need some encouragement. So please do. <laughs> yeah, now, now I feel more like home, yes. All right, so I am so excited. So this is the first time I've facilitated a, a panel. I think I told earlier, I told you that for every single minute I'm here, I feel like more intelligent every day, just because of the bright minds that are in this room. So I really hope that you're going to challenge us and you're going to contribute to giving us specific recommendation on how we can implement this strategy in the different countries that we are uh, implementing it, and hopefully, you know, take it to the broader world. 
if we can. So allow me to introduce my panel. I'm going to ask you to each, uh, introduce yourself. I'm not going to write your bio, uh, read your bio, no. But I will just call your name, and if you don't mind going to, this is where we are, right? Okay. All right, so let me call Gloria Lee from representing Google at the panel. Thank you. All right, Savita Baylor uh, representing Caribou Digital at the panel. And then we have Francesca Chia representing GoGet. Oh. I'm gonna try. Oh, it is working. Wonderful. All right, so what I would like to do is to give you about a minute or so to introduce yourself, how you got here, and a little bit of your company, and then we can go into the meat of the discussion. Does that work? All right, we'll start with you, Gloria. Hey, everyone. I'm really excited to be back. So I actually attended Stern for undergrad um, and graduated as part of the class of 2017. For the past about two years now, um, I've been working at Google as a financial analyst. Um, spent most of my time within M&A or mergers and acquisitions um, on the M&A integration side and then also working in M&A finance a bit closer to the front end of the deal process. Um, and am now on the Alpha Analytics team, which focuses more on competitor intelligence and strategic capital allocation across the company. Um, and I'm here today to just talk a bit about Google um, and about our focus on next billion users and also on um, Loon specifically. All right, thank you very much, Gloria. Savita? Yeah, thanks, it's, it's great to be here. Um, my name's Savita, I'm a research director at Caribou Digital. We're a small um, ethical uh, emerging markets consultancy working in um, digital specifically. So I lead all the projects to do with digital lives, with digital ID, um, users generally um, online and, and so on in emerging markets. Um, I am well, a I, um, I'm an ex-academic, a former academic. So I think Ahmed asked me asked us to talk about you know what led us here, and I think I was very much in, in kind of your position where um, I did a master's in information systems and not exactly business, but um, I wanted to know if there was some kind of social impact that my work could have. Uh, and I went, ended up doing a PhD, um, and the project I went to research didn't have, there was nothing working. Um, and I, I rang my supervisor, my advisor in tears, and I said, what do I research? There's nothing here. And she said, research why it doesn't work. And I think that's driven my work going forward. Um, so yeah, so that's the history. Thank you very much. Francesca? Hi, guys. Um, so my name is Francesca. I'm co-founder of GoGet. It's a platform in Malaysia that connects verified people called go-getters um, to businesses in the area so they can do tasks for them. Um, and it's mainly much more oriented around business tasks. So for example, the business could be a florist um, who needs extra pickers and packers during Valentine's Day and it's, it's completely jam-packed in the office. They'll call on for 10 more part-timers for the, for the day and they just pay them on the app and then at the end the go-getters get to earn flexibly. So that's a little bit of background what I do now. So that's what I'll be speaking about today. But a little bit of a journey, I guess, to get here. Um, I used to be in your seats about nine years ago. I graduated from Northwestern University in 2010 um, as an economics major. And then I went back to Malaysia because I was an international student here. Um, and from there, I worked in BCG, which is a consulting firm, for the last four, first four years of my like employment life, and then I decided to leave and start the business. Um, so I could also speak a little bit about that journey as well. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So at UNCDF, we are focusing on leaving no one behind in the digital era. So I want to start with you, Gloria, and really to understand, obviously, we know Google, and we know Google intervene in uh, so many different sectors in the digital economy. The key question here is for us to understand what are the challenges that the platform face in emerging markets where... Um, tech adoption is low, and it's particularly relevant for UNCDF as we focus on least developed countries and we work in some of the difficult markets. I work in Senegal, I work in Sierra Leone, I work in Benin. I mean, for the rural um, smallholder farmer, for you've met Janine and uh, Jeanette and Joshua, how does that work? What are those challenges that you see and what might have been some of the solutions that Google had come up with? 
Yeah, so um, definitely one of the fundamental challenges is actually just bringing people online in the first place, right? So um, currently, there are over 3 billion people who still don't have um, access to the internet or good access to the internet. And um, as part of that effort, Google actually has a project called Loon, um, which spun out of Google X and is now its own standalone company. Um, and essentially what they focus on is increasing digital connectivity. Um, so Loon you can think of as essentially like a floating cell tower. Um, the balloons are about the size of a tennis court. Um, and they float up in the sky and increase connectivity for unserved and underserved areas around the world, about 20 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Um, and Loon has been deployed in areas that have experienced natural disasters, so um, like Puerto Rico, for instance. Um, and it's enabled connectivity for over 300,000 people um, and is really one of the forces that's like bringing more people um, onto the internet and allowing more people to access digital tools. So that's one example. Um, another example of some of the initiatives that Google has been pursuing include the Grow With Google initiative, um, where across the United States in many different um, local, um, local areas, Google has been working with libraries and governments to um, teach people about the different digital collaboration tools that it provides. So Gmail, Google Docs, Sheets, for instance, um, and has been teaching people how to use these tools for personal use and also to build up their small businesses. And one of the more permanent stops of Grow With Google has been here in New York City. So by our Google office on 8th Ave, um, there's actually a Grow With Google Center where you're able to sign up for free courses and such. Um, so that's really about increasing access to various digital tools. Um, and beyond that, within Google, there's also something called the Next Billion Users Group, or the NBU team. Um, and what NBU is focusing on is the b one billion users, approximately, that's expected to come online in the next four years. And it's been creating tools like files to help Android users um, manage their storage on device and also in cloud. Um, it's we're done projects like Google Station, for instance, that's allowed for internet connectivity um, in train stations in India, for example. And it's um, also facilitated additional ways for Google Pay um, to be used in developing countries. And so um, these are all some of the different ways that Google has been um, seeking to increase access to digital tools and um, to the internet more broadly. All right. Thank you very much, Gloria. Yeah. I appreciate what you're saying, and I want to relate it to the story of Fatou. Fatou lives in Medina Yorofula in Senegal. It's in that area. We estimate that there is less than one financial service point for 10,000 people. Less than one for 10,000 people. I was walking from the subway station to here. I've counted over six points where I could actually draw money. Just want you to think through the journey for Fatou in terms of access. And we believe that without access, you are by default anyway excluded. So for UNCDF and the digital uh, strategy, you see one of the work stream is the open digital payment ecosystem. What we are really working towards is enabling universal access to that digital payment ecosystem. And for FATU particularly, it start with, is there a GSM network in Medina Yorofula that she can connect to? That she has a phone that she can use to connect and perhaps transact. And if she has a phone, does she even has electricity to be able to charge that phone or do we enable her with solar powered phone? And if she has the electricity, then the next question is that she has a service point close enough for her to walk to and actually try to 
register herself for a digital wallet. And if she gets to that point, that she has actually the identity, the ID required to register and have access to that service. And then even if she gets through all these hoops and finally has access, the questions become, is access equating to usage? Is it the same? Do we need one? Is access a prerequisite to usage? Can we have usage without access? Can we have access without usage? can be yes to all of them from where I'm coming from. And it is yes for Fatu in Medina or Fula. Because even with that access, we need to make sure that there are incentives to motivate usage, to build her comfort into that tool so that she gets to become a loyal user. So I can appreciate what Google is doing and with Loon. And I really look forward to having the opportunity to tell Fatu that, you know, we found solutions for you. And those solutions are right here in Medina Yorofula. So I want to come back to the strategy where we are aspiring to leaving no one behind. With what we're seeing in the digital economy, and Savita, I'm coming to you. Digital divide, what does that mean for you? And how are we making sure that we're not leaving anyone behind with the digital economies that's growing across the world? Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought up that question around um, you know, the distinctions between access and use. Um, at Caribou, we talk about meaningful use, not about inclusion and exclusion or a divide of people who are online and offline. So we kind of, um, we qu question the term digital divide because I think it's very easy to, to have binaries, to have numbers, saying we need to get X billion people online. But what does online actually look like? What does inclusion look like? Um, and some of the, a lot of the work that I do is specifically focused on gender, which is just another element of inclusion. Um, but what happens if a woman has a SIM card, but she doesn't actually um, own it, uh, maybe it's her husband's, and maybe the mobile services that are associated with the SIM, she doesn't want her husband to know about. So these are all the nuances that we really want to work on. And I think when we talk more, I just want to emphasize the, the um, importance of research and asking those questions around lives and digital lives and behaviors. And Ahmed was talking about the, the ethnographic research, the methods, um, and some things that I, I really wanted to recommend. Um, some work by, just, just really quickly, some work by, um, I don't know if any of you know the work by Robert Chambers. Um, yeah, so he's done a lot of work. I mean, he's, I think in his 90s now, and he's still so respected, which is amazing, but his work on participatory research. And I just read a quote from him the other day, which said, um, it's harder to unlearn than to learn. And I think that's so important when you're doing research in a demographic which is not yours to try and understand what their lives are like. So I'd love to talk more about the research methods when we talk. Um, but Chambers' work, portfolios of the poor, all those things I think are really critical to understanding, to kind of um, approach the subject humbly and leaving our you know, privileges at the door. Yeah. If I could jump in also with yeah. this whole access uh, aspect, because Malaysia has a very different uh, or has a nice angle for, for this discussion, right? Um, access for internet and also uh, data is actually quite widely spread in Malaysia. So it's not as um, big of an issue, for example, compared to certain countries in Africa. Uh, we have more SIM cards than people in, in Malaysia. Um, but now we, this is now the use case to show you that despite them having access, there's a gap, right? So when we started our platform in Malaysia in 2014, we, we, I had this 70-year-old um, um, go-getter that came in to apply as a go-getter to earn on part-time basis. And I said, oh, um, do you have a smartphone? And he goes, no. You know, what, what is that? Like, I have the old block kind of phones. I don't know what we used to call them. Just like, you know, the standard phones, <laughs> right? And, um, and it wasn't that stores obviously sold smartphones, but there's even education now that you should make sure that different segment of the nation is also brought along and not leaving anyone behind. So retirees and the older group, for example, were they taking care also in terms of bringing them through the journey? Um, and now this uh, retiree is able to earn also on a part-time basis, so we're including them as well. But that is an example of how um, despite access being available everywhere, if we don't provide education or the campaigns or the incentives, like you mentioned, to also bring certain segments that may not get that naturally, they also kind of get left behind and then they won't be included. Um, 
And then if you look now in terms of mass, uh, in terms of then the usage of the technology and the access, what change and societal change can you actually bring about if they have access? So in Malaysia, if we have access, how can we change society? So um, I think our unemployment rate in ASEAN is actually 3.3%, which is relatively low compared to Europe. But 75% of our employment is informal. This really means that people are the roadside stall seller. So in terms of that, how can we make sure that employment for them brings about protection? That's what the work we do for my platform can kind of do that. But that's an example of how kind of that access, yeah, it was, it was that, but is it solving the problem? Very well said, yeah. very well said. Yeah. Well, actually, we're going to stay with you. And uh, I appreciate what Savita said earlier, because for us, the old leaving no one behind strategy is really anchored on the customer. It, it starts with that customer. What empowered customer means to us is really making sure that we are leveraging digital tools to give the customer uh, or improve the heart and soft skills of the customers so that they can use digital to you know, achieve their own goals. They can use digital to have access to financial services. To, they can use digital to also have access to entrepreneurial opportunities out there. So the, the, the question for us in that work stream is how do we leverage that digital realm, soft or hard skills, financial education, entrepreneurial education, opportunities. So it's great to have these services out there. Not so great if Fatu doesn't even know they exist. So it starts with awareness, but it also starts with empowering Fatu to be able to make the right decision on which tool is actually the best one for her and be in control of the outcomes that this is going to bring in her life. So I really want to ask you, Francesca, and then what we are doing with go-getters, what are some of the challenges that you might have seen in you know, leveraging technology to um, help uh, people have access to jobs and what you are doing to strengthen their soft skills, for Great. instance? Yeah. So to give you a sense, the challenges that we had since we start, when we started in 2014, the first one was just trust. A lot of the time when we told people, hey, you, you can just create a job, someone in the air is going to come by and they're going to do it for you. Um, back then, Uber also was like Malaysia, so Uber only just joined really at that exact same year. So when we, did, when we started, it's not a common thing to get into a stranger's car. So it's also not common to call for a stranger to do something for your business or to do something for your, for your home. So the first, the first level, like you said, is all these extra noise that is presented when you're really executing. Because technology exists, the market exists, but when you're really executing, this noise of, can I trust someone? Would I like to shift from WhatsApping or calling my, my sister that has a friend of a friend to do the job to actually saying, I'm going to trust a stranger to do the job and supposedly this platform is going to be verified. There is a gap to educate the market to do that. So we spent a lot of time the first year just on awareness. Then the second and third year, we, we, got, we got more traction, but that then meant we had to be more efficient to scale up. And that's the problem that, and that's one of the other challenges then that we face, which is scaling. Um, we offer a wide service to our businesses. They can use go-getters to, do, to be a dispatcher, but they can use go-getters to also be a picker or packer for, for the warehouse, or they could be also a promoter. But when you're trying to sell different kind of use cases, it's really hard to also change behavior. So the first part, dispatch seems a bit easy because everyone kind of sends something. It seems a bit low-hanging fruit. People have used runner service in the past, so now it's just on the phone, not, not an issue. But when I go to someone, I say, hey, you know, you should also now just rethink your internal processes so that you can use a third-party person always to pack your flowers. They're like, wait, then I have to change my actual systems in my actual back office right? so that any freelancer can come and, change, uh, and pack my flowers. So... It involves a lot more education to convert them through. Um, and traditionally, only very big companies like McDonald's, Starbucks uses part-time agencies, like temp agencies to staff. SMEs, so the small to medium enterprises, would never go to those temp agencies because they're too expensive. And they would never have a solution before. So they used to just go on their social media to say, anyone have friends that can be part-time work for my, for my shop? So now that means that the intent, my search intent, it's just not there. No one searches on demand picker packer for flowers on Google in K and then like go get shows up. That doesn't actually exist. So no one actually <laughs> like searches my service 
So that's why it's a very, it's like very painful of a challenge to figure out how do I then kind of empower the customers or, or market um, these this image to people say you you should really think about the new way of work and change the way you run your business. Um, because the intent is not there. So that's the other big challenge. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, access first, so that you're not excluded. Incentives for usage, so that you, know, you are really able to leverage digital to improve you know, yourself, to improve your economic opportunities, to improve your, your um, ability to access financial services that are re relevant to you. Then for us, that journey also look at what we do at UNCDF and with other partners on the innovation part. How do we leverage digital for the real economy? How do we apply digital to, let's say, agriculture? How do we apply digital to education? How do we apply digital to health? You name it. So for us, it's not only enabling access, uh, incentivizing usage. It's also looking at what are the innovations that are most relevant to our key uh, customers. and also that can have an impact on the economy in general. So maybe for a closing word, I might ask you, Savita, and also Gloria to come in so that we have the opportunity to also engage into questions. Yeah. So? Yeah, I mean, it was a question for, for you, Francesca. Um, one of the discussions that we were having yesterday, because we were talking about platforms and transformational upskilling, so how a platform like you might train your workers, as you said. Um, for everyone here, I was just wondering, how do you deal with the challenge of the social impact yeah. versus making a profit? Oh, so, okay. <laughs> because you know, one of the examples yesterday was a platform called Link, which trains yeah. in Africa, which trains um, tradesmen um, who can then offer services online. Yeah. But there's a chance that everybody who is trained on Link may just leave and go work for themselves, or so all that investment has gone now. They're not available to work there. So, how do you juggle that? How do we, when we're working in social impact, how do we? achieve that balance? That's a great question. I, I, I do realize actually I've spent a lot of time just talking about the demand side, which yeah. is jobs, but let me share a little bit more about the supply. And a really quick short, on, short sentence for us to answer that is that as a platform, any open platform, you are only successful if your community is successful. Right? The more successful the community grows or the larger it grows or the, the, the richer and wealthier it grows in not just in monetary manners, in skills. Um, the better you are as a platform. So I'm completely incentivized to make sure that um, people, uh, whether you're demand or supply, are getting more from the platform. Um, so that means it goes hand in hand. Like I don't optimize for, for because it was as if like you were saying, oh, how do you balance money and then impact? To me, they are exactly the same. They're, for me, my main mission is that I believe that the future of work is not going to be nine to five. It's not going to be only in the office. You can have a one-hour job. You're going to be um, many employers to employee. Um, and people can choose when and, when and where they work. Um, I believe it's going to be a lot more connected and mobile. So by doing that, I feel um, that's the vision that we're trying to drive for, um, a sustainable future of work. And then we, we backtrack and we just need to make sure the company actually pays for its, its expenses and we actually cover and we're healthy so that we can continue to impact. Um, so we have the vision in mind, it goes hand in hand, and then we kind of drive towards that. Okay. Yeah. I know from what I know you're doing, Francesca, that there are also uh, the policy side of it that you're looking at because we're more and more going into towards a gig economy and how do we make sure that the, the security side or these employers, the go-getters, have also access to social security yeah. schemes. So how do we make sure that you know they have access to financial services, insurance, and things like that? And I know you're already doing it, but I wanted to look back to the policy work stream of UNCDF and how you know all of these innovations that you see in the market, we also have to look at it on the policy side. What is it that we can do to make sure that the markets that we are working are as open as possible and they enable these uh, experimentation and, and, and innovations to happen and so that we can get to the scaling a business and making it uh, that um, going hand in hand with the impact and the business side of the, uh, the, the result to come in together and make it a sustainable business for you. So, Gloria, I'm wondering if you have a closing word before we go into the next phase of this conversation. 
Oh, I just wanted to note that um, in terms of social impact, I think doing well um, and doing good for society are not mutually exclusive, right? At Google, um, there are definitely like different aspects of the business um, that are like more focused on profitability, but then there are also aspects of the business that are very much focused on social impact, like Google.org, for instance. Um, and within Google.org, one of the recent initiatives was the AI Impact Challenge. And as part of that, Google.org, Google Launchpad, and Google AI, or the artificial intelligence um, aspect of the company, um, all three of them collaborated together to grant a combined $25 million to 20 different organizations working on artificial intelligence for social good type projects. And um, beyond my core job at the company, I've taken on a side project um, managing some of these grantees. And one of my grantees is working on um, an AI model related to vaccines um, and vaccine potency through the cold chain. Another one of my grantees is working on um, a sign language translation model that um, will help facilitate uh, communication among the deaf and hard of hearing, right? So um, beyond like the core profit centric aspects of companies, um, there definitely are also social impact elements as well. Um, and sometimes they're even more interlinked within core parts of the business. Um, and I also wanted to mention that I think Francesca brought up a great point earlier about feature phones versus smartphones. Um, and as new types of technologies emerge, um, training and development um, for the user is definitely really critical. It's, that's something to think about. Beyond that, I think some other food for thought would be um, thinking through how some communities are leapfrogging others in terms of technological adoption um, as innovation continues to push forward. So I'd urge all of you to think about some of these different elements as we break out into groups um, and as you brainstorm. All right, well, thank you very much. All right, I, I want to thank you very much, Gloria, Savita, and Francesca for uh, terrific work that you've done here and trying to crump into, uh, let's say, 20, 40 minutes, mm -hmm. what we've shared. And I also want to thank the audience for your patience and indulging with us. And now we really need you guys to work now. We've done our part. <laughs> Up to you. Thanks. Great. OK. Um, thanks, guys. That was brilliant. Uh, I think the, the panel was a perfect example of how we think about the digital economy and the digital finance component of it. it was such great examples, you know, really broad, really narrow on the business case. Like, you have to think about both sides of the market thinking about the customer differently. I mean, from the Google's perspective, you know, just the platform economy and the role that it plays in stimulating some of the fundamental access. Um, and of course, Sabine did her job in sort of always bringing it back to our market development approach and thinking about, well, if you had to start to solve for these problems, you got to start somewhere. And it's a big, complex context. How do you start developing relationships with partners in relatively narrow areas where you can start focusing on problems, and the way we've chosen to do it is around our four work streams, um, and you know we can pick it apart. There's interrelationships between them. We'll get into that later. What we'd like to ask all of you now to do at your tables is to pick a work stream. Policy. If you want to be friends with me, pick the policy side. <laughs> um, innovation, customers, you know, open payment ecosystems. We'll give you. We'll give you. <laughs> yeah, just, um, we'll give you an out. You could throw digital ID systems in the open ecosystem component uh, because there's a direct relationship between that. Anybody have questions about that? We can talk about that later. So each table, pick a work stream and then collectively as a group, you know, how would you and the, the skills you have at your table, how would you start to solve for that? What do you think from the conversation you just heard, what do you think is a first order problem that you think needs to be solved? And then what solutions would you create? Would you scale go-gets everywhere, right? When she's like, yes, we're accepting, we're accepting equity funding. Uh, <laughs> um, or would you look at Caribou's work and like if people were just empowered with more information, right, about what the customer is, like what would you do? Um, or is it just more about providing the fundamental connectivity that Google does? And this is just three examples of a zillion different options that we have. Um, so 
we've got about 15 minutes, right? So um, at the end of the 15 minutes, we'll ask some of you guys to volunteer your feedback as the group. So pick a work stream, um, start discussing. We'll be roaming around. Um, could I ask the UNCDF folks to raise their hands? Great. So if you have any questions, don't ask me, ask them. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. We're happy to, we'll walk around um, and we'll try and stimulate some thoughts and ideas. All right, Thank get to it. So much. All right, so if I could ask everybody to consolidate, that worked really well, um, your ideas. Um, great, that was super energetic. It took you all of about three seconds to start talking about it, which is great. Normally people have to sort of warm up, um, but I'm excited to hear what you guys so excitedly talked about. Any volunteers, because we'll just cold call tables. Um, uh, so there's no escaping, but I'm giving you the opportunity. Uh, any volunteers, any tables have, you know, arguments about which work stream to pick or total agreement, um, and then any particular ideas? Right there, just one or five. Just say your name and go for oh. it. <laughs> okay. uh, hi, my name is Richard Olmino. I'm an undergrad freshman here at Stern. Um, one of the things that I chose to do was inclusive innovation. Um, I was thinking more of one of the issues that we have going on today is we begin to see the degrade degradation of the world, predominantly wasteful production. I'm sure we're all aware of this. Um, and we want to take action now. So one of the solutions that I hope to seek is combined digital technology with worldwide access of using approximately 5 billion users that do have access to this kind of stuff um, with reduction to wasteful production. Um, and what it requires is a system of payments to enable and incentivize people to work towards this good cause. Um, one of the challenges that this would face is um, awareness of this. And I think that what we already do have awareness to this kind of stuff using t digital technology to combine with using people to help towards wasteful reduction. One of the ideas that I had in mind was to use an app um, such as the one that you had and um, bring awareness into light that we can uh, enable people to go out and help and into these communities that um, do have waste reduction, wasteful pollution. What this would do is these people would exchange their time um, for money or for uh, um, community service hours or even just to do it as volunteering. But overall, the grand scheme of things would be to use um, all of these, whether it's students, whether it's uh, older people, or whether it's just kids in elementary school. Um, I think that combining all of these efforts would bring us into one good cause and the awareness is already there with digital technology. Um, but one of the things that we do have an issue with going on right now is combining the governance structure for this kind of stuff. It's also shifting the market dynamic more into adding value into the people that are actually doing this kind of stuff. Um, but I think that overall, if this were to be set into place, we can combine all of this together and actually build a better community overall. Great, thanks. I think the idea, so in, in our jargon, we'd sort of be thinking about that as a many to one. 
right? Like how do we get a community of people to coalesce around a singular point for a singular purpose? Uh, you know, network effects, there's a lot of things built into that. It'd be really interesting to play out the payment component as a function of sort of incentives, right? Uh, and, and how that would work, right? So the, is the incentive where it would have a cost, right? So how would you cover that cost? Um, and who would be paying out? Do you have beneficiaries who would say, listen, I'll put a grand, two grand in, you go and you make micropayments to 5,000 people, right? Uh, to do a small job cleaning up a beach. I mean, I could see a lot of applications to it. There's a lot of m sort of mechanical components to that idea that you could really play out. So it's great, brilliant, thank you so much. Um, any other volunteers? And thank you for volunteering, most importantly. Yeah. <laughs> any other volunteers? Table 10. Sabine, you do not count. No, it's just Okay. Table 10. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Michelle. I'm a senior here at, um, at Stern in the undergraduate program. Um, one of, we also wanted to tackle inclusive innovation. Uh, and one of the ideas that we discussed was potentially rethinking the idea of incubators that we see so often here in New York City uh, and around the world to be targeted for emerging markets. And we see it as an opportunity for um, institutes like Caribou Digital and the UNDCF to go in and better understand issues on the ground and collect first-hand research from people who really know the problems while leveraging your expertise and privilege and education to help them create their own innovations and hackle those problems and keep value within community. Um, obviously, there's a lot of issues here. First of one, like the first big one is where is the money gonna come from? What investor would be interested in such a risky um, venture such as this? And then the other one we were concerned about was how to maintain diversity within these potential incubators. So how will we get different people from different communities? How are we gonna represent women? How will we represent religious minorities and things like that without infringing um, on local norms? So that's the idea. Great, thank you very much. Again, with the network idea, I mean, this is, it's really interesting because between the two of you, the power of the digital channels, you can just get so much more scale, right? And if you can organize that scale, there's tons of potential there. Um, anybody not pick digital innovation? Inclusive innovation? You guys, all right, awesome. Table nine. Uh, hi, my name's Joe Kay. Uh, I'm a junior in Stern's undergraduate program, and we picked enabling policy and regulation. Nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, the things that we were kind of talking about was some of the barriers that kind of exist between businesses in lots of different places um, around a given country and the communication they may have with their government. Uh, we kind of also touched on what Francesca mentioned, which is that lots of them are also unofficial and how to tackle things like that. Um, so like a kind of small example we thought of was that the fact that there are sometimes a lot of given dialects in a country and being able to communicate with like a main portion of the country can be almost impossible or just not have much of an incentive. So we thought of like solutions to that to provide access to information and then incentive to use that information. So we kind of talked about just like even a simple platform like a Google Doc or any Google platform that you can use translate almost automatically and you can comfortably talk in your dialect and have like an FAQ sheet where someone can answer and explain how that functions. And then, you know, we talked about what the barriers to that might be. For example, why a small company might want to register what the government and potential corruption that may exist and why they would be interested in having these companies do that, why they would want to invest in them. Um, we talked about how to kind of cultivate incentives, showing the government why it's beneficial to have these companies growing in this way and how it can bring lots of investment and also showing these companies the access to funding and the access to infrastructure they can get from communicating with the government in this way. So, Great, thank you very much. I think on the, the dialect language thing, I think that's brilliant because you're, that's, there's an I, API waiting to be built there. But seriously, I mean, if you would think, I mean, if any of you go to gov.uk, it's a fantastic government platform that simplifies government information. And so if I, if I was, was GoGet and I was a bunch of different dialects that I had to worry about, why would I need to build that function? Whereas a government could build it for you and you just access that API openly. There's a huge opportunity there amongst the other great ideas. Um, Anyone else? Payments, maybe? The empowered customers, we just sort of leaving them behind? <laughs> Volunteers? 
Do I let Sabine pick? It's time for me to pick. Hi, Sir, <laughs> in the back. Right there. Yeah, OK. <laughs> so I'll stand. Our group talked a little bit about. Um, Can you introduce oh, yourself? Oh, I'm Andre. I'm a freshman at Gallatin. I'm not even at Stern. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, so we talked a little bit about digital payments, but we didn't actually come up with like a solution. We just found a lot of problems. Um, <laughs> Welcome to our world. <laughs> yeah. Um, so initially, we learned that um, in a lot of these developing nations, a big problem that contributes to having um, like a massive amount of the population centered around one point of service for a bank is um, instability in power, for example. So if we could somehow leverage power utility like solar panels and make it more um, efficient to invest in something like that, we could reduce that number rapidly. So I guess we did have maybe a solution for that. Um, and then after that, we talked a little bit about maybe that moving towards the goal of a more like smartphone-centric payment system isn't necessarily it, since that's what we think from like a Western culture, that maybe something like that relies on like 3G technology through SMS may be just fine and will actually catalyze more growth than having to learn a lot of new technology. So I think that kind of summarizes what we talked about. That's great. Fantastic. Yeah. I love the... Um, the anthropological twist you threw out there at the end in terms of the means and then the, the means of interface, right? Like just, I think one of the issues with systems thinking and problem solving is just addressing your bias and our biases, everyone in the room, is that this is it, right? Maybe this isn't it, right? So brilliant. And in terms of the clean energy side, and we've got our resident expert here, Vincent, you wanna raise your hand, um, who can talk your ear off. Um, on a lot of potential solutions uh, that we try and invest in around clean energy, including solar, et cetera. Uh, great, I think we've got time for one more. Um, empowered customers, we've kind of got to. Somebody has to have chosen that. Uh, I see a lot of Okay, empowered customers. You got a mic. <laughs> um, okay, so. So we talked a lot about the, the issues in Brazil and the community, specifically in the Amazon. Um, so essentially, because it's very difficult to have access to the cities, so it's very expensive if I produce a product in um, the EDD River, for me to send it all the way to like a city that I can actually make money from is very difficult. So one way to empower the, the customers is by creating a middleman, right? Um, so this nonprofit I worked with this summer actually does this. What they did is that they created several trading hubs around um, different areas in the Amazon rainforest. And then the communities are able to make their products, give it in to the actual trading hubs in exchange for city products. And then the, the hubs do that kind of mediation between the two. They consolidate all the Amazon products and then sell it in bulk to really big companies like Natura and uh, yeah, a bunch of big companies. And this really helps empower the communities and give them autonomy for a million things like land protection, especially in the Amazon rainforest with all the deforestation and all those issues. Um, so it's very empowering for the communities. It helps them improve their income, helps them pay for health and it's been very, very helpful. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. That's great. Thank you. I, I think what's, what's interesting about that is one of the biases that we get caught up in the digital context is removing layers, right? But we've, you've just introduced, an, you've introduced a layer, right? And you've introduced a layer in a way that could really work. Um, and how you've tied the benefit to that community, to the greater needs of the community beyond just trading, is, so now they have an incentive. I mean, some of the questions are, does the community see the broader environmental benefit um, and sometimes we think that's more important than they do, you know, or the timing and the incentives for building it and getting the use case because there's sort of, there's still a business case to be made. Um, so great. I really love, I loved all of your guys' sort of ways of looking at this from different views. I've learned a couple things. Oh. <laughs> um, so, yes, Sorry. go for it. Sorry. I'll indulge me. I've learned a lot, and I've also learned that there is a project working with communities in the Volta region in Ghana, so it's awesome. I have some you know, 
families, African families all the way there, so just in case. <laughs> but it is awesome to hear that. So uh, we welcome opportunities to link and see what we're already doing in Ghana. And if we can link to what you've already doing, I think we'd be more than happy to enable, you know, inclusiveness of that economy. So yeah. just yeah. wanted to mention that. No, oh, brilliant. Really Thanks. Um, so in closing, I'd like to invite uh, Henri Dumel, uh, the director of our financial inclusion practice, to just kind of close it out with a couple words. Henri? Thank you, Ahmed. Um, so yes, my name is Henri Dumel, and I'm leading the digital finance team in New York, based in New York. It's a global team. Uh, so first, my first thought is that I think it was absolutely the right place to launch a strategy. I think to have this kind of dialogue with all of you and hearing some of your ideas is very inspiring for us. Uh, and you know, as we move the strategy, we're in new areas, and I know that the uh, NYU Stern is a business school, but moving a lot into tech as well. I mean, there is a lot of ground of obvious interest and uh, ideas that I'm hearing. So again, I think for us to launch a new strategy in that setting is perfect. So I would like with that you know, to really thank Matt for hosting us, and NYU Stern to really be there. Um, I really wanted to, um, to also thank our three panelists, uh, Gloria, Francesca, and Savita. Uh, I don't know where you are, but I think it was really great. And also to see that, you know, uh, Gloria, you're one of the alumni. So like a few years ago, you were here. So I think that gives you a very good trajectory and inspiration. I think a lot of you guys are going, probably going to work with companies, institutions we're going to partner with in the field. So it's really inspiring. So thank you for the three panelists. I think what you shared with us was, was extremely enriching and, and inspiring. And thank you very much, Ahmed, and uh, uh, you know, for, your, for your introduction, and Sabine for shepherding so well the, uh, the, uh, the panel. And I would like to, sorry? And of course, I was going to finish, you know, David has been the architect uh, of really kind of uh, shaping that event. Uh, so David is working in our partnership units. And I was telling uh, David uh, just before, as well as Matt, that, you know, we are really going to continue our engagement with you. And I think, David, I'm going to call on your uh, continued support to really kind of make that, that link happen. Uh, because I think, you know, we would love to continue to engage with your community and see how we can really you know, build a long-term relationship uh, and work with you to, uh, to see how we are moving the strategy forward. So I would like to, yes, David. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take you up on the offer and share David's email with everyone who registered for today's event. So if you didn't get to share your idea or if you as the club leads wanna continue some of these conversations, through Net Impact and through EDG, we actually have a, a clear link to do that. So, so thank you. Expect a lot of emails, David. Yeah. And and I also wanted to to thank all the other members of the team, you know, on our side also to help organize that event. And whomever I didn't name and I should have, please feel included in that message. So thank you so much. Uh, I also wanted to introduce my colleague John Tucker, who is. Uh, uh, working, I mean, based with me in New York, so I think both of us will continue to engage with your community and Matt, you will, you will hear from us, we will be in touch. Thank you so much again and thank you for all of you. It was a great session, I really enjoyed it. Thank you all, thank you all. Uh, and to the students, I just wanna be really clear. This is really happening, <laughs> right? You're gonna get an email from us with David's contact information, the ideas that you generated in your table discussions today, the folks at UNCDF really want to hear from you, and it really is Mara and my job to broker that relationship. So please take every advantage of that opportunity. We're so thrilled and hopeful that we can use the skills that you learn here at the Stern School of Business to create progress toward the SDGs. Thank you all so much for a great afternoon. Thank you, Matt.